Welcome back to Onward with Scott Chesney. Today's guest uh, is a phenomenal human being. I, I think he's one of the most passionate, purposeful people I've ever met. He's the chief scientific officer at Onward, as well as a director at NeuroRestore. We have Professor Dr. Gregoire Cortine with us, better known as G. G, how are you today? Fantastic. It's great to talk with you, Scott. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. So as you well know, there are millions of people with spinal cord injury, like myself, who have been waiting days, weeks, months, years, and even decades to regain movement. Um, Onward is bridging that gap. Onward is taking what a lot of people thought to be impossible and making it possible. Tell us how that's happening, please. I would like to start by calibrating expectation. We all want to be enthusiastic about people be able to stand, take a few steps. And I think we have seen truly remarkable recovery in uh, our participants. They still live in a wheelchair, right? So it is not a cure for spinal cord injury. But what we are seeing is that the spinal cord stimulation, the way we deliver it with this really patterned stimulation is immediately enabling the recovery of movement people being able to make some steps with a lot of body weight support, poor quality, but then train. And then after several months, seeing quite a remarkable recovery. So one of those individuals, and we'll talk more a little bit later about the uh, Stema Bridge study that mm -hmm. was done with three participants. And there's a, a gentleman, Mr. Riccati, who had been paralyzed for five years, the result of a motorbike accident, totally severed his spinal cord. And now, thanks to Onward Technology, thanks to all your work in Neuro Restore, is that he's actually up to standing, taking steps, and benefiting greatly. How, first, is that possible with a severed spinal cord? And two, is that what do you think the difference is with him? Yeah, it blew our mind to see such recovery in Michel. But I would not undermine the recovery of the other individuals as well. I mean, we have seen even in other individuals with complete spinal cord injury, the recovery of like standing, independent stepping. So the spinal cord is responding very well so far to the stimulation. It's true that in Michel, it's just mind blowing. He can stand for two hours, can walk one kilometer. He has really a lot of confident independence. Uh, despite indeed, as you pointed out, what was classified as a clinically complete spinal cord injury, no sensation, no movement, uh, uh, no activation of any muscles. Uh, and now after the training, he has regained some sensation, some activation of muscle. So he cannot do really voluntary movement, but there's clear contraction of muscles below the injury in the hip and in the knees. Uh, so there's also this neurological recovery we have seen in many participants in the absence of the stimulation, which is, I think even more fascinating for me as a scientist, suggesting that the nerve are regrowing in response to the intervention. Um, so we all know, you know, even spinal cord damage classified as complete in the vast majority of cases are incomplete, meaning there are some residual connection, but they're silent because the spinal cord below the injury is not able to respond to this residual signal. And the stimulation really boosts this residual signal and enable uh, individuals like Michel and others to have uh, an adaptive control over the activity of the paralyzed muscles. Simply amazing. Gee, I, I wanna get back to more of the um, technological advances, what we can expect mm -hmm. uh, coming up in the next few months and few years. But I, I wanna rewind the tape of your life a little bit to help mm -hmm. our viewers here, help the SCI community understand where all this passion, where all this purpose for people with spinal cord injury began, where does it come from? I think there are two sources for me. One is a movement I've been very central in my whole life. I've been like a high level sportive, especially in rock climbing activities. So movement is key. And in parallel, I grew up with Superman being my hero. You know, I'm the kid from the seventies. And when Christopher Reed had his accident, it's really truly impacted me as a person. And doing research in neuroscience, because I was fascinated by the movement, I moved to Los Angeles in Reggie Edgerton's laboratory, trying to understand the control of movement. At the same time, I was engaged in the Christopher Reed Foundation. 
And this is the first time I've been truly exposed to you know, young male like me, often at a sport accident, paralyzed. So it resonated truly with you know, all my passion and what I was studying. At this moment, I truly decided to dedicate my life to the development of a treatment for spinal cord injury. Well, I think if Christopher were still alive, you two might be best friends because uh, for someone who's not paralyzed himself, you're as close to being paralyzed, meaning understanding as many people who are spinal cord injured had some type of accident or injury occur because of some type of sporting event and also being connected to Superman. It's interesting. I've always said even the man of steel can become paralyzed, so it knows no barriers, but you know no barriers with regards to uh, hastening the pace to finding more effective treatments and therapies that are truly helping this community. Um, let's go back to some of the technology now. So there, there's a combination that's there that's waiting for people. Um, is that there are implants, um, which I want you to tell us more about. And then there's going to be transcutaneous, almost like electrodes. Can you take us through those two processes that are in clinical trials right now? True. So let's start with transcutaneous stimulation, which is very close to being available to everyone because it is in a large scale pivotal clinical trial currently in the US. Almost close to 100 patients will have benefited from this therapy so far in the trial. Uh, patches apply close to the spinal cord to deliver electricity in order to enable better movement during rehabilitation. And this is applied with the hope that it will increase the growth of nerve and improve the recovery. And many groups, not only at Onward, have seen benefit from this intervention. We don't now, where, know. Where is that, G, where is that electrode placed? Can it be anywhere up and down a spinal cord? Is there a specific area that you're targeting? Yeah, that's a very good point, Scott. So the general concept is that you apply electricity to target the region involving the control of the neurological function. If it is for upper limb movement, it will be at the cervical region. For blood pressure modulation, the low thoracic region. Of course, for the leg, it's a lumbar region. So the idea that you can target the entire extent of the spinal cord that is disconnected from the brain, even at multiple regions at the same time. You know, when you want to walk, you also need your arm because the cervical region, you know, is also going to send command to the lumbar region. At the end of the day, we inherited it from quadrupeds. So we walk bipedally, but really using our four limbs. So you can stimulate cervical and lumbar and you see clear facilitation. So this is the advantage of transcutaneous stimulation that you can apply stimulation very easily, non-invasively, there's no surgery involved. So it's very easy and you can really distribute the stimulation all along the spinal cord. So the question is, is it the same mechanism that are engaged with transcutaneous stimulation? as are engaged with implanted stimulation, what is called epidural electrical stimulation. And the response that we don't know yet, most likely it is, although there may be some differences. We are actually investigating this uh, overlap between the mechanism of action. But the principle at least of both intervention is similar. Engage the spinal cord with what I like to call the spinal cord gateways which are the sensory pathway going into the spinal cord through the dorsal roots. These are the more likely structures that are activated by electrical current that can modulate the spinal cord and enable the recovery of movement or other neurological function. It's simply amazing. It's mind boggling. Now, can you, cause I mean, we know for everyone out there that might not be familiar, you have cervical, you have thoracic, you have lumbar and you have sacral. Um, can sacral, I know you mentioned lumbar before, but can sacral be stimulated as well? You're thinking about the bladder, Scott, right? I guess. Uh, well, I know. So what's interesting, and that was going to be my next question, is that you are already seeing um, positive effects. And again, it's not your primary focus, but you know, it kind of goes along with the territory, bladder, bowel, sexual function, and even uh, blood pressure regulation, which again, you mentioned before, but these are all kind of like secondary I don't want to say conditions, but second, other than standing and walking again, these are some of the most intense 
uh, parts of paralysis that people have to deal with. So I know that with the implants that you've mentioned in the thoracic region, you're seeing that it has some effects down in those areas I just mentioned. So I, again, just out of curiosity, is there a way of stimulating lower? And um, But I know you're having effects right now. So please tell us about those. Yeah, those like autonomic function, which I mean, I believe for most people are the most important aspects affected by a spinal cord injury. I think everybody would choose recovery of bladder function of a walking. We are aware of this. I know. <laughs> I know. And, and it's not that we don't want to restore bladder function. It's like, you know, we started with walking and we hope we can expand clearly. And that's what we are trying to do currently. The, the bladders for simple organ is actually difficult to manipulate because you know you have this opposite function you have to void but you have to relax also uh, the bladder in order to be able to void and uh, the mechanism though are the same and we have evidence that we know which pathway we have to recruit we just have to be very smart with electricity in order to be able to activate and relax at the same time so currently we are performing a lot of uh, preclinical work in order to target as well the bladder specifically. Because what you pointed out that you are seeing benefits also on other function. It's true that when you train standing and walking in some individuals, you can see recovery of, for example, sexual function. We have seen one patient able to father a child. Wow. It was amazing. We have seen improvement of temperature regulation of blood pressure, et cetera, but without targeting specifically. No, I'm really talking about specific technology targeted toward the bladder, targeted toward blood pressure, which this we have figured out. It worked incredibly well. You know, we have several individuals. We apply the stimulation and boom, right away, even in the surgery room, you see this marked increase in blood pressure. That's very clear. So this is going to be a, probably the first treatment that will become available I hope in the next two, three years for everyone who is in need of this, uh, uh, what is called hemodynamic management. Um, this, is, this is simply amazing. This isn't um, false hope. This is realistic hope. Mm -hmm. Gee, I, I've actually seen you present um, once. Um, I can't wait to have it happen many times because um, I could not stop thinking of myself regaining movement and being able to improve my quality of life, let alone the millions worldwide who are gonna benefit from this technology and these advances and therapies. Um, there was one part in the film that you had showed, which just really blew my mind. It's still blowing my mind to this day is that with the stimulator that's implanted, is that normally when it's turned on, obviously you can see these amazing effects that have been taking place. But there was a portion of that video, and I actually had to ask some of my uh, friends around me who were watching this. I was like, wait a minute, the stimulator is off, and he's still moving. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what's happening there? It's almost like a rewiring of the circuitry in which, you know what, it's kind of like taking over. It's almost like the stimulator is reteaching the spinal cord how to work. Yeah, it has been truly remarkable to see what we call a neurological recovery meaning a recovery in the absence of the stimulation, despite chronic paralysis, like several years of paralysis in these individuals. This we have observed only in individuals with incomplete spinal cord injury. So you know, Asia B or C, all those have seen increase in neurological function. So improved muscle contraction, some sensation, and some, three of them so far, out of six incomplete, I've been able to take independent step, even like climbing up staircases um, without the stimulation, you are right. So it is really striking. We have seen correlates, like what is called neurological correlates in the spinal cord, suggesting that there's a lot of reorganization, as you say, that the stimulator teaches the spinal cord how to activate muscle again. And what is really striking is that this is not that the spinal cord is more activated. It's actually less activated. It's like with the stimulation and training, you are selecting neurons that become very efficient in activating the muscle and get rid of all the noise, no spasticity, spasm, co-activation. You 
get the spinal cord very efficient. And on top of this, the residual pathway from the brain send branches that will increase the connectivity between the brain and the spinal cord below the injury. Those are the mechanisms we exposed in animals and recently in humans. This is fascinating, fascinating. Gee, I, we're going to have you back here many times um, because there's so much that's going on and there's not uh, like there are no two spinal cord injuries alike. There's no two days alike for you because I know uh, a lot is going on. So we're absolutely going to have you back. But uh, it, as you know, we're speaking directly to the spinal cord injured community is that if you're out there with a spinal cord injury, no matter how long or what your level of injury is, what would your recommendation be at this time? in which we can all right here, right now, best prepare ourselves for the technology that it's not a matter of if anymore, it's a when um, it comes to market, when it comes to an, a, an opportunity for us to possibly uh, participate in a clinical study. What would your suggestion be for us? What can we be doing with our bodies right now? Mm -hmm. I would say body and mind. And, and the first with the mind is to calibrate expectation. You know, if you have a Asia A cervical injury, we're not going to use a stimulation at the lumbar level to have them stand and walk. You know, there's so much trunk issue, et cetera. This is not the realistic target. This individual's hemodynamic management, trunk control, upper limb recovery is the target, right? So I think every individual, depending on the severity and location of injury, should set his mind on realistic goals, but we are going to provide everyone with technology to improve certain aspects of their life that is important. And you have to say, you need to be ready because your body needs to be in a state that is responsive to the stimulation. And we have seen this, to be honest, with a few participants who had like a lot of scoliosis, et cetera. So it took us some time to put them back in a state that they could really train intensively with a stimulation because for many years they were just very inactive and even the stimulation engaging the body you know reinforce this asymmetry so you have to be very careful at the beginning when you reactivate this dormant system that took so many bad habits for so many years so if you can engage in physiotherapy maintaining your body in good shape you know that's really helpful to receive the stimulation later on I have to tell you, G, that's part of my challenge here on Onward with Scott Chesney is to best prepare ourselves mentally as well as physically uh, for the amazing work that you continue to do. So I want to thank you so much for creating the time to be with us again. We're going to have you back because there's always plenty that you have to share with us and um, our community is listening and we're quite thankful for all your work. So continue to work hard, my friend, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you very soon. Thank you so much, Scott, for all what you are doing. It's very important for us to talk with the community.